In this lecture, we are going to discuss another integral part of the ARIMA model, the MA model. As you know, MA stands for moving average. However, it's important not to conflate this with the simple moving average and the exponentially weighted moving average we discussed earlier in this course. As you will see shortly, this model is very different from those. So let's get right to what the moving average model looks like. The moving average model is similar to the autoregressive model in that it is a linear function of something. But what is it a linear function of? In fact, it is a linear function of past error terms. This should definitely strike you as odd. In pretty much all of machine learning, we typically create models which depend on input data. In this moving average model, there is no input data to be seen. Instead, the time series depends only on errors. Of course, in order to know these errors, we must have compared the previous predictions with the previous values of the time series. Note that our abbreviated form for a moving average model with order Q is MAQ. This means that the output Y depends on Q past error terms in addition to the latest error term epsilon sub T. Here's one way to think of the moving average model that might help you rationalize its name. Consider what the expected value of y of t should be. As you know, we treat errors as normals with mean zero and variance sigma square. Well, if we take the expected value of y of t, we simply get c, since the expected value of each of the errors is zero. Hence, we can think of the bias term c as the average value, and then each of the errors as fluctuations that make y of t go up or down around c. Another way to think about the moving average model is in terms of simulation. In fact, simulating a moving average process is somewhat easier than an autoregressive process. Let's suppose that we want to simulate an MA2 process, so the output y depends on two past error terms in addition to the current error term. First, we need to generate epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. These are just samples from some normal with mean 0 and variance sigma square. Then we generate epsilon 3. Then we calculate y3 according to our formula, which depends on epsilon 1, 2, and 3, as well as the model weights, which we assume have been given. Next, we generate epsilon 4. Then we calculate y4, which depends on epsilon 2, 3, and 4. Then we generate epsilon 5 and y5, epsilon 6 and y6, and so on. So as you see, this process really amounts to nothing but generating samples from the normal and adding them together. Therefore, you would use this model if you think that nature actually behaves this way to generate the data which you are observing.